Okay, so let's start. Um, any questions from the previous class? Okay, um, so let's just do a quick recap of uh, what we saw in the previous classes. Uh, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is the following. Uh, we want to design a learning algorithm or in other words, characterize the performance of learning algorithms, uh, which which are essentially supervised learning problems. So there is a domain set X and a label set Y. And the goal is to learn, so there's a domain set X, a label set Y, and there's an underlying ground truth, which may be framed either through a concept class, which is a set of functions from the domain to the label set, uh, or through some joint distribution on the label and the domain set. So, um, and we don't get to see what this ground truth is. Uh, all we see are IID samples drawn from the ground truth. And the goal is to, is to do the following from the training samples or the training set. Uh, the learner is to output a function h, which we call the hypothesis. Uh, and hope, which hopefully does well on a completely new instance drawn from the same ground truth distribution. And we assume that the hypothesis function h is drawn from some class of functions which we call the hypothesis class. Right now what we are trying to do is try to see how the hypothesis class affects the performance of a learning algorithm. So, how good a particular prediction is, is measured using this loss function. So it's a function which given two labels, the true label and the estimated label, tells you how good or bad this particular prediction is. And the generalization error is the expected value of this loss over a, a completely independent sample. And in this course, we'll refer to, we'll focus on two broad classes of problems, classification and regression. And the classification problem is one where um, the label set is finite. And for this course, we'll assume that the loss function is always the 0, 1 loss. So um, the loss function takes the value 1 if you make an incorrect prediction, if the, label, if the predicted label is different from the true label, and it's equal to 0 if the predicted label is equal to the true label. Now, you could potentially look at slightly different loss functions in the sense that um, you could weight different kinds of errors differently. For instance, if, if your predicted label is in some sense close to in some metric to the true label, then you could weight it appropriately. In this case, there are only two uh, sort of states where what the loss function can take, either 0 or 1. Right? And we saw that potentially one major issue that you can run into when designing a learning algorithm is overfitting. If your h is too large, then potentially you could do extremely well on your training data, but have a very large generalization error. And the main problem or the main goal in, uh, in designing a good learning algorithm is to avoid this, this phenomena of overfitting. Now, there are different learning algorithms that one can consider, but one of the simplest uh, and one of the most widely used learning algorithms is that of empirical risk minimization. The goal is to minimize the generalization error, and we are observing IID samples. So, hopefully, uh, the empirical risk for any given uh, hypothesis is going to be very close to the true risk, that is the intuition. And so what we can do is, okay, you compute the empirical risk and try to find that hypothesis that minimizes the empirical risk. All right. And we had a bunch of different definitions. The empirical risk is denoted Rs for any given hypothesis H. R of H is the generalization error, which is the expected risk or expected loss for uh, for, a, for a completely uh, for a sample that is drawn independently of the training set and h subscript s is the empirical risk minimizer 
and RS of HS is the minimum empirical risk or in other words the empirical risk achieved by the empirical risk minimizer. Right? And in the last class I introduced this framework of probably approximately correct learning. Now for, for any learning algorithm the hypothesis output by the learning algorithm depends on the training set. So the output hypothesis is always going to be a random variable which depends on the training set and in order to make things uh, since obviously it's it's not possible to learn well with high with, with probability one we will relax that and say that we want to learn well with high probability so the probability that uh, your the, the hypothesis output by your learning algorithm is, is, is away from the best possible hypothesis within the hypothesis class by an amount epsilon, this probability should be less than or equal to delta, where this outer probability is taken over the training set S. Okay. Uh, now, there are two different notions of learning, I mean related but uh, slightly different, uh, depending on what your ground truth is. If the ground truth is assumed to be uh, any arbitrary distribution on x cross y, then we see, then the definition that I gave in the previous class, exactly this, this notion that I mentioned over here, this is what is called agnostic fact learning. All right. But on the other hand, if if we have a hypothesis class which is equal to the concept class itself, then we call this just simply pack learning. Okay. Uh, so agnostic pack learning is a slightly, you can think of it as a slightly generalized version of pack learning itself. So essentially pack learning in the scenario where you have a joint distribution on x cross y, this is what we'll call agnostic pack learning. And in this case, you have some more information because you know what the concept class is. Firstly, the mapping from X to Y is deterministic. And the other assumption is that the hypothesis class is equal to the concept class. All right. So this was really the framework uh, under which pack learning was studied at the very beginning. And this was generalized to this notion of agnostic pack learning. Right. So recall that it, something is uh, a hypothesis class is agnostic pack learnable if um, the probability that the generalization error uh, is is at most is greater than or equal to some epsilon plus the minimum possible generalization error. This probability is less than or equal to delta, provided that the number of training samples you have is larger than a given amount. Right. And this particular quantity, the minimum number of samples that is required to achieve a particular epsilon and delta is what we will call the sample complexity. Right? So this m h of epsilon comma delta is what we will call the sample complexity. So when studying a particular learning algorithm, we are not just interested in uh, knowing whether that particular hypothesis class is pack learnable or not, we are also interested in characterizing what the sample complexity is. So if it is pack learnable, then this notion makes sense because m, this m subscript h is finite. That's, that's what we need for um, pack learning. And in case it is not possible to do so for any finite m, then we say that that particular hypothesis class is not pack learnable. Right? Now, any questions so far? All right. So now let's let's consider a very simple case where you want to do binary classification. So you have an arbitrary set X. Uh, it could be finite. It could be infinite. We don't care. And the label set S is simply 0, 1. 
and what is the ground truth uh, the ground truth is one among a set of functions from x to y so there is a concept class and we'll assume that the hypothesis class is equal to the concept class so we know from what class of functions that the ground truth is drawn from all right and this this particular situation where h is equal to c it's called the realizable case in other words you can realize what the ground truth is and we'll the, we'll make one other strong assumption in this example that is the concept class is finite or the hypothesis class is finite and again the standard framework um you draw a bunch of n id samples now note that there's some source of randomness the ground truth uh consists of this concept class some function from this concept class and an arbitrary distribution on x because the samples that you draw are drawn from some distribution and the goal is to learn well irrespective of what this distribution is so question Generally, it's a subset of the concept. In general, it could be bigger than the concept class. It could be different from the concept class. Right. We are aware. So this is a simple case where we know what the concept class is. Right. And again, the 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 concept could be drawn arbitrarily from this concept class. We have no prior on the concept class. concept class basically depends the actual relation between x and y exactly h is our assumed relation between ha huh. correct so this is a scenario where you know what the concept class is that's it actually if you apply er and right you can actually get the actual relation directly we'll get to that in a okay so all right so we assume that xi is drawn according to px and yi is equal to c of xi so what does the empirical risk minimizer do what is how do you define hs yep um 1 by n fine i equal to 1 to n of again we are assuming that it's a binary classification problem so the indicator that h of xi is not equal to yi um but this is the empirical risk so what is the empirical risk minimizer so it's just argmin overall h in the hypothesis class which is equal to the concept class okay um let's let's just keep maybe one example at the back of our mind uh, think about linear classification suppose that um the ground truth is the following so the ground truth is defined by essentially a line in r2 so my script x is basically r2 it's a set of uh, some point in the plane and the classifier c uh, or or in other words um, the concept the true concept c outputs one if if you get a if you see a point above this particular line and outputs zero if uh, if it lies if the point is below this particular line so c of x is equal to 1 if x is above the line and it's equal to 0 otherwise okay and what class of lines do i consider i don't take any arbitrary set of functions any arbitrary set of lines which define the ground truth uh i'll assume that they all pass through the origin and the angle that they make with the x axis is uh is 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 discrete 
okay for for the, for instance assume that the angles it can make is say minus pi by 3 minus pi by 4 minus pi by 3, 0 something some some finite set right and at the time of trading what do you see you see a bunch of random samples So the green points correspond to those which are labeled 0 and the red points denote those which are labeled 1. So given this information we have to choose effectively the problem becomes one of choosing theta. What is the correct theta from this set? All right. So, so now I mean, in this case, as well as any general uh, case, not necessarily the specific problem, but uh, any realizable problem with a finite hypothesis class, uh, what would be the minimum empirical risk? Zero. And why? Correct. In general, why do you think or in what scenarios can you achieve minimum empirical risk? Exactly. Correct. And in fact, it doesn't matter whether it is finite or not. Because what are we doing? Again, we are not really interested in the complexity of learning. Right? So, it doesn't matter how you find this argument, the assumption is that you can always find the argument. So, if you have a realize, if you are in the realizable scenario, then you know that the, the concept, the true concept actually lies in your hypothesis class. So, there exists at least one function in your hypothesis class which achieves zero risk because that is the true function. Right? Uh, again, the point to note here is that there is no additional randomness. There is a deterministic functional relationship between x and y. So, that is why we can always achieve zero empirical risk. Yeah. It's a subset. Which one? Uh, it's the concept class. Correct. It's a subset of the hypothesis. Correct. Then Even then you have, line. you can achieve zero. The minimum empirical risk is zero. Correct. Again, we are assuming that this minimization can be performed exactly. Right. So, here is another question. Is the minimizer unique? need not be unique right there could be multiple uh, hypotheses which achieve zero risk <laughs> correct so then in in any such problem you 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 always have this confusion right if you go back to the problem of say linear classification you can achieve zero empirical risk but you're not sure if your hypothesis, the hypothesis that you have chosen, is indeed correct or wrong. So, for example, suppose that the samples that you that you could see are like this. All right, because ultimately it also depends on which samples you saw, and it also depends on p x. Right, depends on the data generation process. Now. Let's consider an extreme scenario where all the points that you see are either in the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant. Will you ever be able to distinguish between the hypothesis where uh, theta is equal to 0 or plus pi by 6 or, or uh, uh, plus pi by 4? Are there certain hypotheses that you can minimize, that, that you can kind of eliminate, possibly eliminate? 
Correct. So the potentially the first three hypotheses could be eliminated, but you'll never be sure uh, which of these hypotheses is true. Correct. So, so it also depends on the data generation process. It depends on Px. But then suppose that your Px were such that points are generated only from the second or the fourth quadrants. Does it really matter what C is? Suppose C is, is this pi by 4, corresponds to theta equal to pi by 4, and you predicted your output, uh, say pi by 6. What would be the generalization error? Zero again, right? Not just the empirical risk, but the generalization error would also be equal to zero because with probability one, you are only outputting points from the second or the fourth quadrant. So you can still distinguish between the two. Um, that's of course an extreme scenario, but the point is that um, sometimes the data generation distribution Px could be kind of skewed which doesn't allow you to very easily distinguish between two different hypotheses. But then in the end, it won't really matter. Because again, we made an assumption that the data generation distribution is the same as the distribution over which we test. So loosely speaking, um, the intuition is that if you see a re really large number of samples, then if you if, and, and you are achieving a small empirical risk, then your generalization error will also be low. And for this case, the realizable case with finite number of uh, with a finite concept class, the claim is that this class is in fact pack learnable. It is with respect to a loss. Potentially, yes, true. Right. Um, so, so again, when I say a finite hypothesis class, inherently we are we are also fixing the loss function. We are um, yeah. We are fixing the loss function, we are fixing the input and the, output, the, the domain set and the label set. Right? So everything is with respect to these uh, quantities which are assumed to be fixed. So when you are when you're given a learning problem, implicitly you are also given the loss function. So you are told how your learning algorithm is, go the, the performance of your learning algorithm is going to be measured. That's a fundamental assumption. Okay, so, so the way we show that this class is pack learnable is, is again relying on our intuition, which is that if we see a sufficiently large number of samples, then the empirical risk on any hypothesis should be close to the generalization error that that particular hypothesis would achieve. Right. So, and, and so if you are able to compute or if you are able to approximate the true risk, the generalization error R of H for every single H, then in some sense you would still be able to pick the correct H. Right. And there are only finitely many H. Right. Does that intuition make sense? Right. So, so let's formalize this. Um, so suppose that, so the, let's look at the, we have a concept class C, uh, 
what is the generalization error or, or let's let's do something even simpler let's write down the the empirical risk for a given h this is equal to 1 over n times summation i equal to 1 to n indicator of h of xi is not equal to yi but what is yi really it's c of xi right and what is the generalization error that is achieved by this particular h it is expected value of the loss which is nothing but the probability that h of x is not equal to c of x all right so we want to show that this finite class is pack learnable c is the ground throughout always c will always denote the ground um, so to show that something is pack learnable to show that some class is pack learnable what do we have to show we want to show that the probability over the set of samples of the output of any learning algorithm based on these samples the risk achieved by the output of any learning algorithm is greater than or equal to um, epsilon because in this case it's the, the, the scenario where it, it, it is realizable so the minimum possible generalization error you can achieve is zero so so we want to achieve a risk which is at most epsilon ideally the probability that this does not happen should be less than or equal to delta correct okay um and what is this particular quantity equal to this is equal to the probability that hs of x is not equal to c of x right just just the risk okay all right so among the set of all hypotheses let's classify them into let's partition them into two the set of all good hypotheses and the set of all bad hypotheses the good hypotheses are those for which the generalization error is at most epsilon and the bad hypothesis are those for which the generalization error is greater than or equal to epsilon Okay. R of H uh, is strictly less than epsilon, see, and bad is one for which r of h is greater than or equal to epsilon okay and the set of all bad hypotheses let, let me denote it by h subscript p p for bad all right so now let's consider any bad hypothesis 
Are you talking about the case of H being equal to C? Um, H need not be equal to C. That's good hypothesis. So in the good hypothesis, of course, C is a good hypothesis, but my requirement is not that stringent at all, right? All I want to do is achieve a risk that is less than or equal to epsilon, right? There is, sorry, uh, the, I want to achieve a generalization error of at most epsilon. Correct, but what is the minimum of R of H overall? In this case, it is zero. Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. So throughout, we're we're looking at this very simple scenario of binary classification, and it is realizable. Okay. So when I say this class. I mean that it's a binary classification problem with a finite hypothesis class. The hypothesis class is equal to the concept class, or at least contains the hypothesis, the uh, concept class. Okay. So now, if you take any H, uh, any bad hypothesis, what is the problem? So, what is the probability that this will achieve? zero empirical risk we know that something achieves the minimum so, so we know that um, there is one hypothesis which achieves zero empirical risk so if i do empirical risk minimization i could potentially get multiple hypotheses but but i will select a hypothesis only if it achieves zero risk correct the only problem that I could face is that there could be a potentially be a bad hypothesis which for my which for the samples that I saw achieves zero risk. Right? So for instance, if if I went back to this particular problem, I did empirical risk minimization. Alright? Would I ever choose the hypothesis uh, minus pi by four? No, right? Because it achieves non-zero risk. There are four hypotheses in this case which achieve zero risk. Uh, zero, pi by six, pi by four, pi by three, pi by two. I'm sorry, there are five hypotheses in this case, right? Um, and this this the situation could arise, of course, because the data distribution was itself kind of skewed, but also because I don't have enough samples. Okay, so. If I do empirical risk minimization for this classification problem in general, I'm always going to select something that achieves zero empirical risk. All right. And the bad scenario is when one of these bad hypotheses achieves a zero empirical risk. What is the probability that the empirical risk achieved by this bad hypothesis is equal to zero. So this H can be selected, it, it is an empirical risk minimizer only if this happens. Right? Okay, so when does this happen? I then can you under what conditions on the samples that you saw does this happen? Fair. So h of xi should be equal to yi for every i, i equal to 1, 2, 3 up to n, you you got the same values for h as c, right? So this is the same as 
the probability that h of xi is equal to c of xi for i equal to 1, 2, 3 up to n. Over all the samples, um, over all the samples that you saw, you cannot distinguish between h and c. Right? And of course, this depends on the training samples that you saw. Um, Okay, what is the probability that this happens? So, so anyway, we assume that all the samples are independent and identically distributed. So, this is equal to the product i equal to 1 to n probability that h of xi equal to c of xi. Now, assuming that h is a bad hypothesis. Can I get an upper bound on this particular quantity? Remember that R of H is in this down. what is r of h equal to this is the probability that h of xi is not equal to c of xi correct and you know that this quantity is greater than or equal to epsilon for h one minus correct so this which means that this particular quantity is at most one minus epsilon so this is less than or equal to product i equal to 1 to n 1 minus epsilon since h is a bad hypothesis right so this is just 1 minus epsilon whole to the power n and you see that as n tends to infinity this is vanished Okay, but this is for one specific bad hypothesis. So everything would be successful. We would achieve a. We would achieve a generalization error of less than or equal to epsilon if we never selected a bad hypothesis. So asking for for R of H less than or equal to epsilon is essentially asking for that asking that you never choose a bad hypothesis. What is the probability that you don't choose a bad hypothesis or put other way, what is the probability that you actually chose a bad hypothesis using the empirical risk minimization rule? Probability that R of HS is greater than or equal to epsilon is nothing but the probability that HS is a bad hypothesis because that's how we've defined the set of all bad hypotheses. R of H is greater than or equal to epsilon. Right? Okay, now and we select a bad hypothesis only if it achieves zero empirical risk. So, what is the probability? No, right? So, if so, potentially you you do ERM, right? In the realizable case, there could be now multiple hypotheses that achieve zero empirical risk. One of them is going to be the true. The true classifier or the or the actual concept there are multiple other minim empirical risk minimizers some of them are good some of them could be bad right but we don't know which one to pick so we in general we would just pick something arbitrary so we are safe if 
among all of those minimizers, none of them are bad. Correct? And we want to know what is the probability that that happens. What is the probability that among the set of empirical risk minimizers, there is at least one bad hypothesis. Because we are always doing ERM, right? We are minimizing the empirical risk. So there is really no point in looking at something that has non-zero empirical risk. In the realizable case, yes. So this is the real realizable case wherein the hypothesis class is equal to the concept class. So there is at least one function that achieves zero empirical risk. Right? Okay. What is the probability that this happens? It's the probability that RS of H equal to zero for some bad hypothesis. And what is our favorite technique to bound something of this sort? A union bound, right? You can write this as probability over a union of these events that Rs of H equal to 0 H in H. So H. Okay. So this is just less than or equal to summation H in H B probability that this achieves zero empirical risk, which is well, we have a bound on this, it's at most 1 minus epsilon whole to the power n. So this is just size of Hb times 1 minus epsilon whole to the power n. Okay. Now I can leave this as it is, but I'll do one more simplification. I'll use the fact that 1 minus x is less than or equal to e to the power minus x for any x in r, just so that I get something that's nicer looking hb just a second yeah um this ah, so what is the probability that the generalization error of achieved by the output of the e erm algorithm is at is greater than or equal to epsilon so you will achieve a uh, a generalization error greater than or equal to epsilon if the ERM outputs a bad H, correct? Now there are multiple minimizers. Correct? The RM could, could output any one of these. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Correct? So just to be safe, I'll I'll say that in let's consider the worst case setting where if your set of minimizers contains a bad H, then it always outputs the bad H. Right? So if there was a bad H uh, that achieved zero empirical risk, then let's say that the ERM always outputs that. So this probability is less than or equal to this probability, this, because this is kind of a worst case scenario that A, there was a bad H that minimized ERM, that, that minimized the empirical risk, and the ERM output this bad H only. Because the ERM could, even though there is a H, even though there is a bad H, which is a minimizer, it could potentially also output a good minimizer. It could output C itself. So the worst case scenario is when it outputs the bad edge. Yeah, I'm outputting a bad 
Hypothesis will be there. No, not it necessary. Depends upon the data. Yeah. Well, that is there, but also in this case, there are multiple minimizers, right? You don't know which one to choose, right? So you just choose one arbitrarily. And that arbitrary choice could potentially be good if you are lucky. It could also be bad. Because from the training set, you have no way of knowing which one is the correct one. That's what this inequality captures. Correct. Correct. So, the probability that belongs to the back. Correct. Uh, which one? These two? Yeah. No, no. This one and this one. Uh, this one and this one? Yeah. Well, the thing is, here I'm. Okay. When I say a learning algorithm, it outputs one hypothesis, right? But if I do ERM, there are in fact multiple candidate hypotheses. Right? Um, now, which one, which of these should the ERM output? That is not clear at this yeah. point, right? So let's say that if we can fix a rule, let's say that you order the H in some arbitrary fashion. You choose the first H in some sense, right? Among all the minimizers, you choose one of those minimizers. Your favorite rule for choosing. Okay, so that is why this could potentially be different from this. This event, because among the set of minimizers, there are some good minimizers, there are some bad minimizers. Correct. One of the minimizers is bad. Right. So we are taking a very pessimistic viewpoint in when we are doing looking at this. I'm sorry. Uh, H of S is equal to correct. Yes. Okay, so now suppose that I, I want to I want to achieve a target probability of delta. So how large should n be? This is to be less than or equal to delta. Then n should essentially be greater than or equal to. It's going to be 1 over epsilon log size of h divided by delta. Okay. There's only one true classifier, right? If the ERM is unique, then great. Then we don't have to worry at all. Then, then this can never happen. If the output is unique, then it means that that has to be the true concept. And if that happens, then the bad con then no bad hypothesis is output by the ear. Which one this? Uh, which one? Uh, you mean to say when this when this is equal uh, to this? Correct. Um, when it's when there's always one H uh, that belongs to the bad class, but also well, maybe among the minimizers you choose a root. Right? You're fixing. A, remember, you're fixing a particular C. All of this is calculated with respect to a fixed C. Okay. And for whatever reason, among if you choose a minimizer, then you decide some rule a priori such that you never choose C if there is another minimizer. Okay. For instance, let's let's maybe go back to this this example. 
okay maybe the ground truth c uh, is equal to um, zero or or let, let's take on the scenario if it's equal to um, pi by two okay and your erm rule is the following the erm rule is you look at all possible uh, thetas which achieve zero empirical risk and among those if there are multiple then you choose the smallest theta okay so then if there are multiple thetas that achieve zero empirical risk then you will never choose pi by 2 that's one scenario where you could get equality Any other questions? This is not something we can compute. No, you can't compute, correct. Which one? So again, the learning algorithm doesn't know what R of H is going to be. So you're right. right? So again, there are two different, in general, in statistical learning theory, you have to take two different viewpoints. One is of the learner. What does the learner get to see? What the hypothesis class is? What the samples are? That's it, nothing more. And there's another viewpoint which we will take like an oracle. So the oracle knows everything. It knows what the ground truth is, everything. Right? It knows what it can. So this oracle can compute R. Correct? Right? So when we are saying that it should achieve R, the learner is never going to be able to say for sure that it can achieve a small r. Okay. But, but now we are taking the perspective of this oracle who knows what the true distribution is and therefore can compute r. One way to think about it. Okay. But again, at the end, the point that we are, the conclusion that we are trying to make is that even if we don't know r it doesn't matter right so we did all of this right and this was with respect to any arbitrary distribution okay. uh, so let's look at the final conclusion what does the final conclusion say it says that if i have a finite hypothesis class h is known and the hypothesis class is equal to the concept class then irrespective of what px is irrespective of how the data is being generated as long as i have at least one over epsilon log uh, size of h divided by delta many samples right i'm guaranteed that no matter what the data generation distribution is my erm algorithm is going to achieve uh, a generalization error of at most epsilon with probability at least one minus delta. Which is something the learner can't compute. Correct. There no comments can be made on the like size of bad hypothesis. You can't. And Correct. That is the reason. That's exactly why I'm upper bounding it by size of h. Right. So you're 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 very right. I skipped that particular point. Um, so this is actually less than or equal to size of h b. But I'm, in fact, upper bounding it by size of h. Because I don't know how large the bad hypothesis is. It could potentially even be zero. All right. And, and the set of bad hypothesis depends on what the true concept is. if it's p is equal to zero there is nothing to be done right so in fact if your epsilon is like really large then it doesn't matter what you output right? that is what would essentially give you hb equal to zero okay so like before we proceed uh well, we did this for sort of a very specialized case, binary uh, classification and finite hypothesis class and the realizable case. These are three assumptions that we made in doing this particular derivation. Now, in fact, 
you can very easily relax some of these assumptions. Now, even if you had, say, multi-class classification, not binary classification, things would not really change because, because when we are looking at R of H, we are only looking at probability of H of Xi not equal to C of Xi. We, in, in this whole thing, we never really required the assumption that we were doing binary classification. So it holds true for multi-class classification as well. And in fact, you can generalize it even further, even if it's a problem of regression, it is not very difficult to sort of tweak it just a little bit. So you can, the more general scenario is that if you are in the realizable situation, irrespective of whether you are doing classification or regression, finite law concept classes are back learned. Emphasis on finite. Right? Because ultimately, even for the simple binary classification scenario, we really needed this union bound for things to work. Correct. So the number of samples that you require is at least log of the number of hypotheses that you can potentially have. Right, um, which means that if H is infinite, then this this whole approach is not going to work. But as long as H is finite, essentially most of these things just go through. Union bond is a very loose bond. Correct. So, are we saying that even if we had a more stringent bond, um, if the class is not finite, then it's not? I, I'm not saying that. Right? I'm saying that this particular approach is going to break down if uh, H is not finite. Right? And that's really what we want to know. R infinite, because that's really the interesting scenario. If you have a high, finite hypothesis class, then there's not that much to do. Can you say realizable things? That means that the concept class is the same as the hypothesis class. Yes. Effectively, you know what the concept class is. In general, the hypothesis class contains the concept class. Okay. And in fact, you can generalize this a bit further and show that all finite hypothesis classes are agnostic pack learnable. So even if there was no true concept, there's an arbitrary distribution Pxy, and you want to choose the best hypothesis, then ERM actually does well. So, as long as H is finite, you can show that this H can be agnostic plot learner. So, we need no other assumptions except finiteness of H for this general approach to work. Agnostic plot learnable means that this. So, what we want is that the generalization error should be within an epsilon of the minimum possible generalization error achieved by among all possible hypotheses within your hypothesis. Right? But the relationship between x and y, it could potentially be a random relationship. There need not be a deterministic relationship between x and y. All right. Uh, in fact, we'll I'll at least try to give a sketch of this proof. The, the approach is ex is very very similar, but we'll explore some things, a more general phenomena that will allow us to show that all finite H are agnostic path learners. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So so, so let's look at the, let's first look at the more general case where the relationship between x and y is not deterministic. So, in the case where you had a concept class, there is in some sense you know what the best possible choice is. The best possible choice is that you output the true concept that is going to achieve zero generalization error. But now, uh, suppose the relation, so for a given y, x, the output y is the true output y is a random quantity. Because 
x the ground truth is defined using a joint distribution on x comma y in this case suppose that we even knew what pxy is then what is actually the optimal predictor the minimizer of the expectation which is what so let's assume a binary let's assume a classification problem so you want to minimize the probability of error right um, can you give an explicit form for uh, argmin over what an expectation of um, again with respect to pxy of r which is the probability h of x not equal to y right r min overall correct right so again i am i'm telling you what pxy is right what is the minimization over all possible functions so again I, i'm not worrying about a hypothesis class here at all right? i'm telling you what pxy is you're allowed to do anything you want Right. Okay, but what do you think this is going to be? What do you think the minimizer is going to be? I mean, I agree that this is the minimizer. Argument over all possible h of this is in fact the optimal predictor. Not restrict. I'm telling you, there's a closed form expression for this in terms of pxy, of course. Like even xr. Correct. That is, in fact, going to be the minimizer. So, this particular h of x. Again, remember that your predictor is a function, correct? Whereas the actual relationship for a given x, y is the the, the ground truth y is not a deterministic function of x. It's a random quantity. So, the best guess is. You choose the argmax overall y in y. Again, y is a finite set because we're looking at classification problems of the p y given x y given x. Right. So this minimization you have you have an infinite search space. Whereas in this, you just have a finite search space, right? You just have to look at those all, just run through all possible y, calculate p y given x, choose the one that achieves the maximum. Yeah, use base rule, right? Um, this is of course assuming that you know what p x y is, which the learner in fact doesn't have access to. Right, but this is sort of a baseline. Even if you knew p x y, what is the best that you could potentially do? Base this is what is called the base classifier. Or another term that is used to, that this is that uh, that this corresponds to is the maximum a posteriori probability decision. So this is, we will call this the base classifier as is more common in the learning theory community, but this is also called the maximum a posteriori decision tool. Maximum a posteriori probability okay. so no matter 
what kind of a learning algorithm you choose you can never ever possibly beat the base class so in the scenario where you had a concept class you could achieve zero generalization error but now the minimum possible generalization error that you can achieve is the generalization error of the base classifier okay so Again, we're looking at classification problems, which means that um, the label set is finite and we're assuming the zero one loss. So in this case, for any H, irrespective of what the hypothesis class is, irrespective of what the learning algorithm is, uh, the generalization error that is achieved by H is always lower bounded by the generalization error of the base classifier. So that this is true. Again, it's fairly easy. You just write down, expand the risk. Uh, this is a probability of error, um, or in other words, the pro probability that you're correct. And you show that that's always maximized by the base rule, base class. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, there's only one maximizer there. What is PY given X? So P, what, what, so suppose that the true relationship between X and Y is a deterministic function. Then what is PY given X? Um, not exactly C of X. It's basically the distribution with prob which puts probability one on C of X and zero everywhere else. So then again, you you get the same. Hedge of X is C. Right? I mean, hedge of X could be something different from C of X in the sense that uh, the arg max need not be unique, right? depending on what X is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, my bad. So yeah. So in that case, it is going to be equal to C of X. Yes. But depending on P X, there could be multiple. Um, the, the potentially there could be uh, multiple hypotheses which achieve zero generalization error because px could potentially put zero probability on certain points that allow you to distinguish between two different hypotheses c and something else no 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 so there's one c which is the ground truth right if px is not equal if px of x is not equal to 0 for all x then the base classifier is equal to the base uh, what if px is not equal to 0 sorry if px equal to 0 for certain values of x You are maximizing over y, but inherently you assume that um, px is greater than 0. That's what the care about. Maybe one gets off. 
uh anyway we don't get those x how many times i draw from the correct perfect. that's the point that i'm trying to make that uh, there could be two different that is among all of the hypothesis that achieves zero or in the specific case there could be two multiple hypotheses one including the concept that could achieve zero generalization error which one um so your observation you're trying to predict y right oh, correct you're right so this should be the maximum likelihood uh, that would be p uh, no it's correct the one which is most likely so it is the map so the ml rule would be max overall y of p x given by I mean, in general, when you define ML and map, typically X is the input and Y is your observation. Here we flip those. That's why you are getting confused. Well, we observe X. We get X and we have to predict. Correct. In general, like when you see it, let's say in digital communications, you see Y and then you want to predict X. Here it's the other way. If we want to predict Y on the basis of X. Y is put in that set. Yeah. In this case, yeah, Y is in fact. This is sure. because X is the input to the. So it's output. so it's not really input output. It's rather what is observed and what has to be predicted. In this case, X is what is observed and Y is what has to be predicted. In that sense, isn't there may be an ML kind of interchange? No, it's not. I'm sorry, should there be? Um, yeah, so there should, it, should, it should be an indicator, or I can just get rid of this particular. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so so now we've seen that in general, if uh, you don't have a concept class and you're a, you're in a scenario where the true concept is not realizable, the minimum risk that can ever be achieved by any learning algorithm, the minimum generalization error that you can achieve, is potentially non-zero. So, so now there are two sort of different problems. In general, in a learning algorithm, you fix a hypothesis class and you try to learn this particular hypothesis class, which could be different from the ground truth because you chose a bad hypothesis class. The second is among within this hypothesis class, you could still be bad because you don't choose the best hypothesis. So, so now there are these different sources of error, if you can call those, um, and there are these different phenomena that, that can happen. So one thing is that H does not approximate the ground truth. So, or, or in other words, how well does H approximate the ground truth? And that can be captured by how far, well, we know what is the minimum possible error that can be generated if we knew the ground truth, and that is R of 
that is the, the generalization error of the base classifier. And what is the best that you can possibly do within this hypothesis class? It is R of min overall h in h of this. It need not be zero. They don't be zero. Well, because what does it mean to be zero? Let's even take the classification problem. Um, if the label itself for a given input, if the label is a random quantity, the true label is potentially random, then can you say with if you, what does it mean to achieve zero risk or a zero generalization error? It means that you can predict with probability one, predict correctly with probability one. For a given input, there, there are multiple outputs which occur with different probabilities. So, even if you knew the statistics, again, any algorithm is only assumed to know the statistics. Right? It doesn't know what is the actual realization. So, if there is more randomness present, you cannot say with certainty what the correct label should be. Okay, so how well does a particular hypothesis class do? Um, one way to look at it is the minimum possible generalization achieved within the hypothesis class and see how far away it is from the base risk. So this is what is called the approximation error. How well does the hypothesis class approximate the ground truth? Okay, this is one thing. Assume that this is assuming that you are actually able to calculate what the what the risk is, but in general you you don't know what that is. So the other is the estimation error. which is well you have a bunch of samples and then you compute the empirical risk how close is the empirical risk to the actual risk and there are a bunch of other you know, things quantities that you may also be interested in looking at for example what is uh, we are in general going to be looking at the empirical risk minimization rule and the generalization error that is achieved by this is equal to r of hs right uh, now this could potentially be different from r of let me just call it h star which is the one that achieves the minimum generalization error in this entire hypothesis class. Right. Again, the learner cannot compute this. Which one? H of S is the output of the ERM principle, the ERM algorithm. Right. So this H is a random quantity that depends on what samples you saw. for a given class capital H. But what the learner can compute is only Rs of Hs and Rs of H star. Right? If Rs of H star is very very close to R of H star and in fact if Rs of H is close to R of H for all H then you would indeed choose H star. And then you would have a, so if you have a small estimation error for every H, then potentially the actual error that you achieve is going to be very close to the base, uh, the base risk. We can achieve it. 
Correct. The best possible that you can do is achieve head start. Which? Which one? This quantity. That is. Correct. That is. True. So this quantity is is going to be uh, whatever. It's going to be non-positive. Uh, and this quantity is always going to be non-negative because R of H star achieves the minimum possible in H star, in H. Sorry, sir, H not be no, no, no. I mean, R S of H star need not even be the minimum among all possible H. Oh, sorry, R S of H star is not necessarily equal to the minimum possible R S of H among all H. That is H S. Which so H star is 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 the one that achieves this. Just one second. Yeah. Any R of H Correct. H it can't compute so any R. All of these, like each of the four errors that are above, are actually not The last one can be computed. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. It can't compute H star. I agree. Because it doesn't know which one is H star. But yeah, so it can't compute these errors. You're right. But it can compute RS of HS. It can compute RS of H star without knowing that that's actually the correct H star. Which which is term? So these two H stars are the same. Uh, which one? Because this achieves a potentially a larger risk than the minimum. This is the minimum possible risk, right? This is the minimum possible generalization error. And H star is the one that minimizes the generalization error. So this can only be greater than or equal to this. Whereas HS is the one that minimizes the empirical risk. So any other H will only achieve a larger empirical risk. So you're right, none of these errors can potentially be computed, but these could be estimated. Uh, the last quantity. So the idea is that hopefully if the sample size is large, then this is going to be a proxy for this. And that's going to be the fundamental idea throughout. We're not going to be able to compute any of these errors. At least the learner is never going to be able to compute any of these errors. But, but the way we analyze the specific learning algorithm, is, is through computing these errors because we know what the ground truth is. The learner doesn't know what the ground truth is. Right? And the point is that this depends on the learning algorithm, whereas this doesn't depend on the learning algorithm. It depends only on the hypothesis class. That's there, yeah, but that is fixed and that is known. Is it always the case that it uh, misses our function? I'm sorry, I don't follow. Means for error of loss, okay. the, the value which we get by missing loss. Okay. Is it, if, if, if we can achieve some other best pitch with any other loss? So, so throughout we are going to be, we will assume that for a given problem, x, y and l are fixed. All right. Because that in some sense, you know what you must do. Right? Because that's how you pose the problem. Now h, again, we, we had this engineering problem, which we formulated as a mathematical problem. Right. For the learner, I mean, to design a good learning algorithm, Part of it is how you choose the hypothesis class. L is fixed because that's how you are going to determine whether a given learning algorithm is good or not. But in choosing a learning algorithm, there were two things. One is you choose a hypothesis class 
and then how you choose a h from this hypothesis class right so right now what we're going to what we do is effectively what this is in some sense telling us is that you decompose it into two problems one is okay somehow you choose a hypothesis class right and how would you choose a hypothesis class based on something that achieves a small approximation error hopefully now suppose i fix the hypothesis class now this is very difficult to do because i don't know the ground truth so it's not really possible for me to compute and i know that if i choose my hypothesis class to be like really large so that this approximation error is zero then it could lead to overfitting and my generalization error could be bad in fact as you'll see there is a kind of a trade off between the approximation error and the generalization error that is if you try to make in general like in a, for a very general problem if you try to make the approximation error too small then it lead to overfitting but again if you try to make um but if you if you choose h to be very very small your hypothesis class is very small then potentially you could achieve a very small um for example this could potentially be made very very small but then your approximation error is very large so your generalization error is also large so ultimately it boils down to how do you trade off between them. Any other questions? Okay, so let's stop here.